If you could um, put the messages in the any questions in the chat, we can we can get to it at the end, hopefully. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody for taking time to listen to what I'm up to. Um, so for those who don't know, I've been working in the raccoon module space. Um, I remember because I don't really think I have the skills to do core stuff, but I really like raccoon and enjoy hacking on it. Um, and around the beginning of the year, I realized that there was a bit of a gap in, you know, certain um, aspects of the module ecosystem around data analytics. So I started work on what I call Dan, which is Raku data analytics, um, like red and crow It has a little three letter name. I thought that would be fun. Um, and for those of you who don't know, data frame is, is, you know, it's kind of, kind of a core feature of, you know, the existing, uh, data analytics libraries, um, core concept. And this, this talk, by the way, is not, wasn't written primarily with a Raku audience in mind, with solely a Raku audience in mind. I think it's it's kind of intended to be interesting for who's here, but also to be accessible for people who've never heard of Raku before. Um, because I, you know, I'd like to see Raku grow and I'd like to see more people interested in you know getting their hands on these, these great tools. So the audience that I kind of think this plays to is the data analytics, data scientist type community, people who are using Python pandas as their kind of primary data to tool. Um, I looked, um, I think it was like a couple hundred thousand people in the, in the Python um, Reddit community and there's about a thousand raccoons. So um, it's a much bigger audience than our internal <laughs> set of um, people, which is uh, kind of interesting. And so within that set of people, um, I think there's kind of a spectrum, you know, between people who are deep scientists and who really don't care about the, the tools and whether they're using, they use Python and pandas because everybody else does. And they don't, you know, they're not experimental around the tools. And they've got a lot of support around that and a lot of education, it's very easy to use. And then the other end of that spectrum, we've got people who are more, you know, they do data science, but they're more programming kind of mindset and they're quite interested in working out what else they could be doing, you know, and, and uh, finding new ways to do things uh, that might be more efficient and more, um, more flexible. So yeah, so, so if you haven't come across the concept of a data frame before, it's, it's basically, this is from the pandas docs, it's basically a two dimensional labeled data structure. Um, and it can be thought of like a spreadsheet or a SQL table or a dict of series object. So series is, is a, uh, each column in a data frame is a series, and series has is all, 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 all elements in the series of one type. Um, and there are performance reasons for that. If you have you know low level libraries like Arrow Two, for example, that has a fast columnar vector processing, then um, that's going to help you go fast when you when you're doing the uh, you know the, the heavy lifting. Uh, I'm kind of referring back to Anton's truck picture yesterday, if you remember. The big truck. Um, so we need we need something like pandas to do that heavy lifting. So Dan itself is is intended to be kind of a um, a top level module that is the defines the API essentially to a set of um, uh, you know library and language bindings. So you can imagine Dan is at the top here, and then below Dan we have Dan pandas for talking to pandas, the Python pandas library that goes through inline Python. And it's in, in light gray here because it's not ready yet. But there's this other thing I'm working on now, which is Dan Polars, which uses the Raku native call to talk FFI to Rust. So that's something which is uh, probably been hacking away on that for about two or three months now. So it's getting to the point of its first release quite soon. And so Dan exposes these concepts that are already very common in, in those libraries and there are other things like R, for example, and Julia that have, have these in them, which is you know, the notion of an, a series object or a data frame object or a class. You know. um, I think of that, so Dan itself is a pure Raku module and, it, and it, then you load in Dan Pandas or Dan Polars in the, you know, the, the correct ecosystem to connect through to Python or to Rust. Um, so if we're just looking about a, a Dan, um, it's a, it's a rather Zen concept. Um, 
it's really a way of packaging together a whole bunch of stuff in Raku that um, I believe contains many data analysis. You know, Raku itself has many data ana analysis constructs and concepts natively anyway. Um, this is a new slide I did. I, I feel a little awkward putting this on the screen to everybody without having put it past Anton, but I thought coming off the conversation yesterday, I wanted to just kind of start to be thinking about, well, okay, we, we don't just have Dan within Raku, but we also have um, other options and other ways to do data analytics, which is great. I really encourage that. So um, Dan Polas and Dan Panas, we need these libraries to, to do the heavy lifting, you know, the, to go fast, basically, but that comes with a uh, an ecosystem cost. So I've got to have everything else running the library below. And it also comes with a, a cognitive cost because the APIs for these libraries are pretty, pretty um, awful, frankly. <laughs> um, on the other hand, you know, there's the pure RACU space where you have, where you have Anton's world, this data reshapers and generators and so on. Um, obviously going in that direction of machine le learning, fantastic. Um, very, very flexible. You know, if it's just a pure RACU world, then you can, um, have these these concepts of labeled data sets and so on. You can reshape them, manipulate them so easily. It's fantastic, um, but it's not going to give you the kind of uh, um, vector performance that the library will. And then Dan itself, just without the libraries, kind of sits in the middle. It's kind of I think of it as kind of a mapping layer to map over from this kind of very freeform world in the bottom right to the very kind of structured world in the top left. And a typical workflow you might start. Um, you know, organizing your data, data wrangling in a very freeform way. And then as you get to these typed libraries, you need to sort of tighten that up. And Dan's a kind of step in that. Um, and and uh, we'll hopefully soon we'll get um, Dan be a target for the DSL work that Anton's doing as well. Um, okay, so that's kind of enough about Dan. Let's think a little bit about, um, or I'll share a little bit the way I'm thinking really about um, Python and Raku and polars and pandas, so I've got this two by two matrix. So you might have, pol so typically somebody today of this audience that we touched on is gonna be starting with Python and pandas. And a lot of those people are gonna be moving up here in the diagram to polars because they wanna go faster. And polars is, is according to the benchmarks about 10 times faster than pandas because it's using all that fast rust and arrow two stuff under the hood. Um, so Raku on the right hand side, um, you know, can uh, now is uh, getting access to these libraries like pandas and like polars. So you can use Raku with either of these two libraries. Um, and sure, I think when we have polars, we're going to have pretty much um, speed parity. I think Raku itself is quite slow relative to Python. We talked about that the other day, but because these are big data jobs that are using the underlying library, I think that's going to dominate the performance characteristic in a typical workflow. So roughly speaking, Python and Raku will be at speed parity when we get to um, Raku, you know, Dan Polars. Um, so, so you'll be able to do more stuff with Raku and you'll be able to do it at you know, the same speed as you can do it with Python. At that point, I think it could take off. Um, but that begs the question, which is what's the more stuff? <laughs> so that's what this talk is about. And it's trying to sort of, as I, as I pull these things together, it's kind of, for me, it's a learning experience of, you know, how, how can Raku really um, make a difference to people's workflows and really help them when they're starting to, you know, hack on their data problems. And um, so a lot of people call it data munging or data wrangling. It's the process of data capture and cleansing and manipulation before you're ready to do the deep analytics work. Um, so that's one, one area I think Raku is very strong. And the other one is, really the focus for this talk, which is um, using the, the Raku kind of gradual data typing to um, formalize up data contracts between, let's say you have multiple people in a, a data science workflow, then you might want to have a for, formal you know, uh, uh, agreement between what is in the data before I go ahead and do the analytics on it. So I'm going to be doing data validation and we'll be able to describe the validation I'm doing and to, and to do that validation as I'm, as I'm kind of moving it into a more typed environment. Um, so the slides are, are online here. I'm not gonna dig into all of these things. Um, I'm gonna try and do a bit more hand-waving instead and talk about uh, you know, the, the way Raku feels when you do this 
compared to um, Python and, and also I've been you know, working in Rust, very strongly typed language. So I, I think I find it very hard to imagine it would be a realistic step for a Python coder to start coding, you know, typical Python coder to start coding in Rust because Rust is, is really hard. You know, it's very strongly typed for good reasons, for safety reasons, but it means you, you the programmer, have to have a whole bunch of things in your head around, you know, what data types I'm working with. So Raku is a really interesting space, which is kind of um, very free form, uh, you know, if you want, you don't have to use types at all. And then you can start to lock things down in a gradual way. So it's pretty neat. Um, so for those of you, again, that don't perhaps know, familiar with the Raku type system, um, in practice, what does that mean? Well, I have things like allomorph, so I can read in something which is, a, let's say, an int string. I don't have to know whether this data I have is an integer or a string at the, at the start. You know, I can determine that as it works through my, my workflow. It might be that I need to put it into, so I think Anton had an example of stuff that stays as strings forever. I, in Raku, you can add two strings together, and if the strings contain you know, digits, they'll, they'll give you the result. Um, you know, coerce over. It's, it's a very flexible model with, and it's got um, really neat kind of uh, hierarchy of types that lets you pick the level of structure that you need for the phase of the pipeline you're in right now. So pretty cool. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I kind of listed out, you know, some of the things of the Raku type system that I think are um, applicable here. Um, things like type, comp you know, being able to define your own types, being able to compose types, um, being able to apply types through signatures, um, even in, in multi functions and so on, um, being able to use types freely between regexes and other parts of your code. And we'll see a bit of, bit of that in the middle, using operator overloading. So, so you know, in Python, I can add two series together. Um, so I want to be able to do that kind of thing, depending on the type of series. You know, and have um, and, write, and have people doing a workflow be able to define their own operators if that's appropriate for their their problem space. And I kind of map that into the the original set of you know aspects of data wrangling that is listed on Wikipedia above again for people who want to re refer to that later. Okay, cool. So um, I'm conscious I'm just you know using a lot of slides here, but let's switch over to demo mode and see it in action. The first thing I wanted to share with everybody here, oops, uh, just need to hide the, quite sure how to remove the, excuse me guys, I'm just going to de-screen share for a second just to get my stuff sorted out. Um, I'm going to re-share again. And that's more like it. Okay, so I'm just going to start over here. So this is this is the uh, the acid test, you know, a live demo. I'm not going to read this stuff here, but it, this is all um, what I'm doing in, in Jupyter. A, people, a couple of people mentioned Jupyter Notebooks. That's what we're going to see in a minute with Dan working inside Jupyter Notebooks. Um, there is this GitHub repository that has the instructions on how to build all this stuff. Um, specifically, it's built here in AWS LightSail. There are basically there are four boxes based on, based on the Docker that I provide here. There are four boxes you need to fill out and then hit go and it will work and it's free for the first three months or whatever for a certain size container. And then you go ahead and open up your uh, container here. And uh, this is what you see. So this is this is a Jupyter environment. Um, this is called Jupyter Console. So it's a little bit more sophisticated than the basic notebooks. And I've got four notebooks open here. So I'm going to start, start with this one. Um, so the, the concept of, uh, before I do that, <laughs> I just want to show you what we're working with. So I picked some data up from, through a different example that I've been, I've been sort of steering, uh, the, you know, the, what is data munging kind of example I found out there. It uses this website. This is the Film for Award for Best Actress, right? And then being on Wikipedia, you can edit behind the scenes. And so there's this basically custom Wikipedia markup table for all the, for all the wider data that's, that's on show here. So I want to pick that out from 
from Wikipedia. So that's where I went to get it from. I put that same uh, information over here just for now. And you can probably pick it out with, uh, you know, some kind of uh, wget or something. Um, and then I can just, so I've used Dan, Dan at the top here, and then I've just, you know, I can load in, just say the, you know, first 20 lines of that so you can see it. So I'm loading that into a, uh, an array. Um, and the first thing I'm going to do is clear that box. And the next first thing I'm going to do is then I'm going to run this, this regex. And so as I was working through the examples here, it made me, it just really opened my eyes as to just how powerful Raku regexes are for doing data um, cleansing and data manipulation. So we saw those um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the kind of level of complexity of that custom markup language. And in just a few lines here, I don't know, what is this, 20 lines? I was able to write and apply, you know, the regex that then picks out the names from, from that kind of uh, noise. Um, and just run a for loop here. So, but, so I've got basically three regex is defined. So, you know, a Raku regex can call another one. Um, so I can do a title case word, one upper character and so on. I've got lots of comments in my, my Raku here, which I think is really neat of the new regex, sort of spaced out regex um, uh, formats. And I've got a year, so simple stuff. And then I just kind of run, run through it. I have a list of exclusions, which are words that look like a title case, but I don't want. Um, and then we have it. Okay, so I've got my data extracted and then that's the data capture phase. Um, I'm going to map the data items in, into a 2D array. Ah, <laughs> sorry, my kernel seems to have uh, just done a little wobbly there as part of what, what I call the demo effect. Um, let's see if I'll just run that again. Hopefully it will still be clean. Yeah, that looks good. So this is this is a Dan data frame that you're seeing here. So I just went my DF equals data frame new and pushed in the data. Once I put the data in a 2D array, which is what the intent is above here, uh, push it in with the column names. Automatically generates a row index if, if you don't give it one. Um, now what I'm doing is, is I'm thinking, well, how can I start to apply in practice to this data frame some, some Raku types? So, so here's a new type I created, which is a, a, a series called a year series. Um, and Within that, I just with when I when I, when you create a year series task, it basically has within it um, a a, a Raku Dan series, which handles everything else. So basically, this is a wrapper on the Raku Dan series, and it, at creation time, so tweak, as I'm sure you know, is a late late phase um, uh, constructor, is I'm actually going to look in here and I'm going to fail, uh, or in this case, die, just to keep it simple, unless um, it meets all the criteria. And I've defined, you know, it needs to match the regex, for example. So I can bring that regex type in. So I can imagine a, you know, a shared library between, you know, teams doing a, a data science type workflow, having all these definitions in an external file, and then being able to use them at different phases in the workflow. Um, and now I can make my new year series here. I put in my my. Uh, um, here's a simple, just a simple one, just to show how how the that would look normally and just creating a new series. And I've simply I've got a name series. So I'm testing that we match the name regex. Again, the year one, I'm also ch checking out between, you know, start and finish dates. Cool. And now how do I apply the year series and name series to my data frame? Very similar concept, a wrapper on data frame. So I have a new class called film data frame that embeds uh, a Dan data, you know, vanilla Dan data frame and, uh, and uh, um, uh, delegates all of its uh, method calls to that. Um, so that's cool. So um, I've created that class data frame and now let's use it. So I want to create a variable, which is film data frame. And I want to put in um, the DF data frame that I created way back above. Cool. Okay, now that's that actually fails. And <laughs> this has made me laugh a lot when I saw this, when I was preparing for the talk. So I, I did a bit of graphing around. It turns out that um, actually there is the, the digit sequence 1942 in that Wikipedia page. And yeah, you know, we might just pick that out in a very straightforward way. So I thought that was a lot of fun. Cool. And then the other angle, there's some, some a few other uh, aspects of Raku I just wanted to share with everybody here. Um, so I've got my uh, uh, same data, same information. 
uh, just in fact stepping through the part one and part two of the same same flow here so so it just takes a little bit while in this jupiter environment to run um you know the the, the regex over all, all the um uh, uh, all the text in the in the source file so i think when you know when you when you were to use this um in production in a work data science workflows you'd be playing around here at this level so the this performance of the raku is not that material and then you would map that into Polars or a, or, or a pandas um, low-level kind of vector set of calls, um, and uh, yeah, we did that already. So we're just getting to the point where we made the data frame. Um, so uh, I just realised that I had a five hundred three error about twenty minutes before I started the talk here. Um, so I just want to order a new launcher. Um, what was I looking at? I got to load this thing called text plot from Anton. Uh, Let's just get this going in the background. Should have a terminal coming up here. Okay, if not, we'll come in a minute, hopefully. Um, so the first thing I, I thought would be, um, I've heard a few comments about around, and I think it's very common in um, kind of data validation, data cleansing workflow, is to, is to have a look at what you've got. Um, so I thought I'd start by just playing with the, the Raku core bag uh, capability. The bag is a data type that has a, a, a key name, and, and then the value of that pair is the number of times that the key appears in the data set. So if I if I take so so a lot of quite a few things going on here. First is um, the data frame has a, has cascading accessors. Seems to show something. Um, Server connection error. Okay, you might do find this demo is a little bit shorter than I hoped. Um, so there's still a bit of bit of flakiness around the um, uh, the, the Raku kernel for Jupiter. Um, and I, in fact, I said the five or three error I got before. I think it might be the whole service is a little bit a little bit uh, not happy today. So um, right, okay, I think I'm going to bail at this point. <laughs> Flashing all these errors all the time. But to say, you know, we can use bags to do. Um, I know what I can do. Let me just flip back over to where I was before. I did a few, as a backup. I did a few screenshots here, just to uh, be careful of what I'm doing. You know, in case things went wrong. Um, right here we are. So that's what happens when you run this this bag. Um, I've actually written a just a one liner that basically um, makes a simple histogram. You know, it prints this uh, plus uh, the number of times. Uh, you know, based on the value of that of the uh, uh, of the key value pair in the bag. So I, I thought that was quite interesting um, just to play with the Raku core capabilities. Um, then I loaded uh, Anton's text plot, um, which is great because this is exactly what you need, I think, for um, very fast, you know, either CLI or in a, in a um, kind of Jupyter type notebook environment, get a quick idea of your data. So I use text plot, um, you can set the point characters, you push, just push in the keys. And the values as arrays into this. I just had to um, use the plus star here to coerce the keys to be um, to be numbers because the keys are objects um, in a uh, uh, as the output of um, the series here. Uh, cool. Okay. And uh, what that shows you is a um, little histogram from 1940 to 2020. The number of times things appear, and lo and behold something an outlier in 1942 so that would have told me right away about the error i saw and then finally i thought well some other cool things in, in raku that are maybe you know available in python but very sort of you know non-core kind of functionality through a module and so on um, which is the set math that you can do again native in raku so i thought i'd make three sets act set r set a, a set r set f set you get it the film set here that's a little joke by the way um and then i can you know is is bipasha a member of the actor set i can do the um intersect of these three sets the little um uh, you know we've got the unicode operators here so it looks really cool for people who come across the source for the first time and then i can easily just make an inverse lookup to say here's my here's my intersect of names and then what years did they win um cool and then the, there is within the within the um uh, Jupyter example, um, it, 
I then show the use of Dan Pandas to take the, uh, the pure RACU Dan data, uh, data frame to export it via uh, Dan Pandas to a Python Pandas data frame and then to use Pandas Seaborn and Matplotlib support. So this is actually an image of a, uh, a Python workbook showing all the, you know, the usual Pandas, Matplotlib kind of outputs that you can get. Um, cool, okay, so let's get back on the main slide presentation. Um, so quick look, this is, this is how um, Dan looks, how, how it builds data frames under the hood. So pictorial on the left is, you know, the different um, kind of classical names for the different parts of the data frame that you get in Pandas. Um, most, so in, you know, in, uh, in Dan, what I have is a, a 2D array data, dot data, and that contains the data. Um, it's, um, uh, can be um, uh, used the standard kind of 2D accessors with a semicolon in the middle. Um, and so they got hashed for the index and the columns labels. Um, the data slice is basically the, the, uh, the items of data, you know, in another, again, another array with a name and an index. And then you can add the data type and you're just mixing in the data type here with a, with a series role. It's all done as roles. So, you know, in the future you can do gas bill does data frame and that should work too. Okay. Um, so again, I won't, I won't read through this, but a whole bunch of things from the RACU core that have been helpful. I mean, for example, just as, as, a, as a key example, you know, in Python, you have to import NumPy to even get a, a NAN value. That's right there in, in the standard in, in RACU. So this is the roadmap for Dan. Um, green stuff is pretty much there. Um, it's, this is all kind of beta. So, um, you know, please uh, do raise any issues you have. And uh, you know, I'll get on as fast as I can if you want to play with this stuff. Um, blue is kind of in prototype. Um, and so Dan Dan Pandas, um, more so I think than Dan Polar's. Dan Polar's still a few weeks away before it's going to be ready for you know the first you know, real utilization. Um, and these blue things, they, they, so so basically, the, one of the issues that I have with Pandas initially is Pandas API is just huge. It has like 430 method calls. And it, you know, although Python is very easy to learn, stuff like Pandas is, is enormous. So I felt that um, what we should do is, is keep the Dan API simple, keep it very RACU oriented. Um, and then if, if we want to layer on functionality like building you know, SQL-like query or you know, pivot tables like a, you know, a, a spreadsheet or you know, specific support for sets or for uh, matrix math, regexes and so on. We can, we can build that stuff through kind of a standardized layer, which so I think of Dan Meza, sort of mezzanine layer that works with Dan API where you can, where you, can uh, you know, um, implement kind of the higher level functionality um, through a much smaller API subset. But at its core, you know, I have this working because RACU is very strong and it's array support working as um, kind of an array view initially with it, with uh, things like splice operators and that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Um, questions on that, obviously very happy to take those. So here's an example of Dan Meza. So this is a standard deviation method at the bottom. Uh, it's going to be a square root of a, you know, blah, 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 and the mean, and then map over x squared to within them, you know, elements minus one. Um, so uh, that means I need three methods in, in my uh, standard deviation function, so, which are not in the API core. So that Meza example, you know, has count and mean, and then that in turn uses LMs and sum, which are part of the core API. So that's kind of how things map down. Um, so yeah, I'm very keen to, uh, you know, in, encourage and invite people to join in and help, you know, if you would like. Um, this is all new stuff. It's a great opportunity to come up to speed on, you know, the, the, the data science world from a RACU perspective and have all that OFA and we have hacking on, on RACU. Um, there's some very lightweight stuff like writing these little meta, meta methods. That's very straightforward for somebody who's, who's not feeling they want to get too deep in. I'm happy to provide support and guidance. Um, 
people are welcome to uh, reach out to me at my email here, p 6 steve at fernival.net. Or, you know, direct message me on any of the platforms out there like Reddit or, uh, um, uh, you know, IRS. So that's great. So I really appreciate um, everybody taking time to listen here once again. And uh, in the, in the uh, um, there's some links there if you want to go get the slides from, from the, uh, um, the TRC pages. Questions are welcome. I, I have a comment for five. I thought you might uh, might be one of the more um, uh, yeah you know uh, closer pa participants, Anton. So I'm, I'm very happy to try and answer anything you might have. Uh, thank you for referring to to some of my work and my talk of from yesterday. I would say um, so. Swift language, uh, which I kind of demonstrated yesterday on an iOS device, having a recommender. They they have a library called Tabula Data and. Um, it's basically data frames based, but they also have a slice object, which is a similar, it's similar design. I honestly, I didn't know, or I didn't understand the need for it, but from your explanations, I kind of, I'm a little bit more, in, you know, more agreeable now with having this separate, uh, separate object, you know, data slice in this, uh, in, in the tabular data. Um, the other is what I would say, uh, well, it's obviously data frames they become very popular with Python, but this is more like S statistical language and R, right? And one of the things which they did with uh, named rows and columns, right? Which is kind of an essential feature in this data frame functionalities is what they, um, they basically can do quite a lot of symbolic mathematics without having symbolic in mathematics implemented, right? And so it's like, and this is one of the things I'm, I'm going to, to ask about, uh, uh Dan Meza is it um so in a sense you can can I plug in any kind of methods with which I can scan the data frames is this the design or yeah so this is a great question so the design because the you know pretty much everything I I code I tend to start with kind of the least locked down version of it so so the most flexible version i you know and the most public version using kind of the um public accesses and so on and that's the nice and this is you know i know this is um perhaps very different to you know strictly encapsulated and, and properly let me say properly designed you know oop um so i felt that and I, I'm actually planning to put some of this rationale, by the way, in my blog. So hopefully this will come to light later on and we can debate it and discuss it because it's not fixed, you know, it's open to change. And um, just one example of that is I noticed you had some some uh, method calls like um, aggregate, you, you know, or, or so on for the data for you, for your modules, Anton. And I actually, would, you know, if you, I'd like to try to reuse that same, those same method call API, you know, um, approach in some of the Mesa area so that we can have common, you know, like that Mesa query box could use use the same method, you know, call kind of syntax APIs. So anyway, that's a, that's a separate discussion, I think, which I, I can't, I haven't thought it through enough yet and looked enough deeply at your stuff yet to, to work that out, but that's the, that's the intent. Um, so yeah, the, the idea is that, that so um, with Dan, it, if you want to talk to dot data because it's um, just a you know the, the 2D data array that contains all the data items, you just say series dot data, you know a little square bracket, row row address, uh, column address, and then when we've got shaped arrays coming along, we should hopefully be able to just pick those in. I mean, so so have that data be a shaped array. Um, Hopefully that'll go a bit, bit quicker, but they're not there yet. Not there yet. Um, so does that answer your question? That you, you and yeah. So so I just there's one other example of that. So what that means you can do is I've in, implemented the um, uh, the roles for hyper operators, for example. So you can run a hyper operator query, you know, hyper you know hyper operator um, uh, um, operation across all the data. In, in the data frame 
at native hyper speed, you know, and doing all the parallelism and so on that you would expect from Raku. Um, because I'm not sure the vector world is the best way to go. I, you know, my, philosophically, I'm a bit of a um, MIMD guy rather than a, you know, vector processing guy. And I think Raku has has built in a lot of concurrency stuff that I haven't even scratched the surface yet. That it, so when I'm saying that, you know, Polars is or Panda, yeah, say so Polars is quicker than than native Raku. Um, I think that there's still part of me that says native Raku could go real fast for a lot of these operations, particularly if you, if you API that you can really hand tune it with AST, you know, you've got the concurrency. So, um, but it's, but it, you know, I think it's important that regardless of that, I think it's important to people, people to see that Raku talks very, very um, openly to to pandas to the pandas world and to the polar's world as well so um i just you know so dan feels like it's um it it's it's adding quite a lot but it's not it's not necessary you know if you see what i'm saying yeah i think yeah you you responded most of i think most of what i meant to ask you know what i meant in my my question but something else you mentioned now and also in the presentation, the pro proliferation of functionalities or operators in say pandas. This is exactly the same complaint uh, seasoned or old uh, users of R complain for the corresponding library tidyverse on which pandas is, is based in R, right? And they're saying, well, why this library produces 200 functions and operators, right? I mean, in a sense, uh, the old languages like Python and and uh, and R were designed from scientifically minded people who wanted to have maximum functionality with minimum set of uh, operators, but that kind of changed, especially with data scientists. They, as we said if it, if in your talk, they don't necessarily want a program, or they don't necessarily care about learning the programming language. We just want the functionalities to kind of construct the pipelines and etc. This proliferation of operators, yeah, it's. And to some extent in your answer right now, what you're saying, in order to address the different speed ups and the trade-offs, in, in some sense, you have to you have to expose this to the user in one way or the other. I, I, I don't know. I mean, my answer to this is basically using natural language interfaces, you know, which are not complete, that uh, natural languages are too vague to be precise for this kind of work, but they can give you a good start. So yeah, it's... Yeah, I, 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 and by the way, to the extent that I understand it, and I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not a steeped in data science kind of guy, so um, a lot of this I'm uh, looking at it with relatively inexperienced eyes, you know. So I'm, so I'm, I'm looking at the design of polars, for example, um, and uh, you know, um, kind of aping that, right? But trying to do it, trying to reinvent it in a far, in the, in the way that you know is doesn't have this terrible proliferation and, and kind of doubling up of, of um, concepts and, and, um, and method calls and so on. So, um, yeah, so, so I, I'm thinking um, what you're doing, which is very, I, th I see yourself as, as you're doing very visionary stuff, which is really new and bringing Raku, you know, in a really unique way to, to come into the space and provide people with, with something entirely you know the natural language processing really really cool was i'm kind of just saying well okay i'm going to take what you have today in pandas and just give you something familiar and then you can grow up from there you know so it's a it's a slightly different approach but i think they're very complementary is is just my uh, i hope we can we can keep it that way you know yeah i would say they're orthogonal they're not complementary but you know it's a, meaning yeah it's the same thing it's just do you want to what uh, yeah ideally at some point you can switch from one to the other because of, say, you know, addressing some <laughs> uh, three dots so three three switch seamlessly, right? This is why I'm saying or yeah. no, not necessarily complementary. Uh, one or the other. It's more like kind of you, you know, it, it needs to. You need to make this, the switch. All right. Yeah. So I, I just have to chat from Richard. Please go ahead. Please. Sorry, it's not meant to be just a, a two-person chat. Thank you. Do, do you have a question, Richard? Was anybody else? No, no, I was, I was quite interested in the conversation, but it was going a long time <laughs> between two people. <laughs> well, that's cool. That's cool. 
is we've got to get the dynamic that everybody has to uh, you know have a chance to pose a question and yes. and uh, you know hear what they want to hear. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not quite sure how you do a, a show of hands on uh, on Zoom, but do, do people generally um, have a lot of familiarity with data science concepts, or is this is this something that's kind of new? I can see some some shaking heads. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's. I have a comment. Anyway, yeah. Thanks, thanks for your feedback. Hey, so, Paul um, to say something. Paul has his hand up. Paul, please, please go ahead. Oh, I, I was just saying I'm familiar with data science concepts. Ah, cool. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I thought that was a one asked a question. So, uh, I'll like I see your hand, hands up. Do we want to take a bit more from that, or we could go offline and do a? No, no. I'll, I'll just make a brief comment to uh, answer to what you're saying. Basically, everyone in the rock community is uh, fully equipped to do what classical machine learning was, which was much more programming and less mathematical artifacts. In some sense, if the, this revolution in 2012 with deep learning didn't happen, I would say you know most of the Raku programmers would be almost ready to go to do machine learning if they want to. Um, data science, it's much more about dealing with actual data and producing you know producing some correlations and etc but if you want to do machine learning almost anyone from what i have seen so far in the rap community can 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 start do machine learning okay and i'm done <laughs> okay so i guess no more questions um Thanks for your feedback, everyone, and uh, I look forward to watching the rest of the talks. <laughs>